Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We are still in our series, I Am Worship. Last week we talked about different postures of worship. I saw a couple of you try out the, the posture today during, during praise and worship, it was nice. We practiced a few of them. Next week, next week we're starting a brand new series, it's December called Amazing Grace. And Amazing Grace will lead us all the way up to Christmas and New Year, all right? So you do not wanna miss out on that series, it's really exciting, I'm really enjoying writing it. Today, I wanna talk to you about something very powerful, something very important, um, and I think this is a great season of time to talk about it, and it's worshiping God through your gifts. Worshiping God through your gifts. Bringing your gifts to the Lord is an act of worship. And I also wanna take some time today to explain and talk about giving to the Lord, all right? But I've also written this sermon in a very unchurched kind of way. If you are already concerned about me talking about giving, uh, I promise you, you've never heard a church talk about giving this way before, or finances. I'm gonna do a brief moment inside this message and coach you a little bit on your personal finances. Is that okay? You trust me to take you down this road without any offense? Okay, all right. Um, I wanna look at, leading up to Christmas, I wanna look at Matthew chapter two, verse one, and it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King, who? Herod. King Herod, King Herod was not a good guy. King Herod was actually very um, upset about the prophecies that there was a king of the Jews, the king of kings coming into the earth, so he wanted to kill Jesus like at any expense. Magi, wise men, say wise men. <laughs> wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And so let me explain to you what they're actually saying there. They're saying this, where is the one that we have been anticipating all of our lives? Because the prophetic words of the king of the Jews coming to light had been not to them, but to their ancestors. And so they've been raised with these stories that one day the king of the Jews would rise and they've been waiting their entire lives and finally they see the star. Where's the one that we've been waiting all of our lives for? We saw his star and when it rose, we have come to worship him. Just think about the commitment that they look at the sky every night waiting for the sign. That's just wild. Watch what it says here. When we saw the star, we have come to what? Worship him. We saw the star and we have come to worship him. The reason that they came to Bethlehem was to what? Worship him. The reason why you came to church today is to worship him. That's why you came to church, okay? You came to church to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we're not just talking about singing songs and having our hands raised. That's not what we're really saying. We're talking about we've come to church today as an act of service to God, one, for community, to build one another up in our most holy faith. This is an act of worship. We've come here today to worship God, to worship Jesus. Now, King Herod, being an evil man, he kind of panics. He, he, he suddenly, he's afraid for his kingdom. He's feeling threatened. And he says to these magi, he says, hey, whenever you find him, will you let me know where he is so I can go worship him as well? He's lying, right? He's lying. But the magi are what? Wise men. They're wise men. They know, they know that it's not the deal, okay? Check this out, verse nine. After they had heard the king, King say, let me know where he's at. They went on their way. They didn't, even, they didn't even bother with what he said. And the star that they had seen when it rose ahead of them, they followed it until it was over the place where the child was. They saw the star and they followed it. Now, 
We read that one little verse, but we can't really understand the magnitude of what that says. They saw the star rise and they followed it, right? It's one sentence, but what does that one sentence mean? They actually traveled from what would be known as Persia or modern day Iran all the way to where Jesus was, and believe it or not, it was a little over 900 miles. 900 miles they traveled on foot, on camelback, on horseback, whatever it was, but they traveled 900 miles. This was a painfully long travel. It took them a long time. Many theologians believe they arrived to Jesus around three years old, where Jesus was a three-year-old child, right? So we don't really know how long it took them, but we know that Jesus is not a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes anymore, okay? Church statistics say that the average Christian doesn't want to travel more than 15 minutes to go to church. Current church stats, 15 minutes. And these dudes traveled 900 miles to what? Worship Jesus. To worship him. Watch this. Here's where I want to get to. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Overjoyed. Not just joyed. They didn't have some joy. They were overjoyed. When they saw the star, they were what? Overjoyed. When you woke up this morning and saw the snow outside, you were not overjoyed, a lot of you. A lot of us were not overjoyed. I was like, oh my God, I didn't think it was supposed to snow till later. We got to make sure the sidewalks are cleared, right? You know what I find in the church today? I find that the church is severely underjoyed. Church wide, I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about church universal. I'm talking about the church. It's severely underjoyed. We should be the most overjoyed people in the entire earth. We should easily wake up with a kick in our step because we have the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. We have an eternal hope through Jesus Christ. We know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, like we have this hope. Yet I feel that churches across America have some of the nastiest mean people. And I just think to myself, did you not get the memo? Did you not get the memo? It makes no sense to me that we serve a God who loved us in spite of the fact that we could never earn it or deserve it. The fact that anybody who could ever sit in a church with like a sour puss face just boggles my mind that you don't understand the hope of your calling, the hope of eternal life. We come to work, church people, there's going to be people who are in churches today that go to worship God and they're angry. They have anger in their heart because they had a fight with their spouse on the way to church. And so they're sitting in church angry instead of being over. Joy. There are people who sit in churches with critical hearts and critical spirits, nitpicking every part. Ah, oh, the haze was too much. I can't believe that lights flashing in my eyes, right? I just, I just want, but you have the joy of the Lord. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives and dwells and abides inside your mortal body. And these guys are overjoyed, but they don't even have that promise yet. We have the promise, and churches are underjoyed. I'm just going to tell you, and I'm not even looking at anybody in particular, but if you actually have the joy of the Lord, let your face know it sometimes <laughs> so that other people around can see it, all right? Being a follower of Jesus, you should be full of more joy than anybody else in this world. And it doesn't matter if you had a bad day. A bad day doesn't equate lack of joy. Oh my God, you don't even get that. You don't even get that. Just because there's a bad day doesn't mean that the bad day gets to steal the joy of the Lord. 
Like you don't get to have the bad day when it's God's joy. It's not even your joy. It's borrowed joy. Oh my gosh, okay. They traveled 900 miles or so so they could worship him. They couldn't even wait. I'm sure that as they were traveling, they were probably singing songs in their caravan of people. They're singing songs of this hope that they're gonna meet the king. Verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they did what? They bowed down. They showed a posture of worship. They showed a posture of worship. They bowed down on seeing the man child. And we talked about that posture last week. Now, how did they actually worship? And I want you to watch this very careful because this is what the scriptures call their form of worship. It says that they came to the house and they worshiped him. And how did they do it? The second part of verse 11, Matthew 2 verse 11, it says, they opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How did they worship him? They presented gifts. They presented their gifts. They presented the thing that equated to who they were, to what they did, to a value that meant something to them and a value that meant something to the king. They were overjoyed, they bowed down in worship, and they presented their gifts to the one who would save them. And I just throw this out there. They were overjoyed to give. They did not give underjoyed. They did not give under compulsion. They did not give under being forced. They did not give grudgedly. They were not upset to give. They gave. And what did they give? They gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's been debated for centuries, and this really isn't the point of my message today of what the gifts actually meant or what they represented. But general, the general thinking about the gold is that it represented his kingship, that he was the king of kings and the lord of lords, so they wanted to present gold to the king. Uh, the frankincense, many people believe, pr represented his priestly role in ministry, and the incense actually were the sort of thing that were used to help embalm a body during burial. So many scholars believe that that was a foreshadow that Jesus was actually born to die, okay? So whatever your meanings of the three gifts are, all I wanna say is this. Are you ready for this? Even God Almighty paid child support. <laughs> Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. In that one gift, and let me just tell you, it's not like your little manger scene at home where they presented one little tiny thing. No, no, they had chariots full, chariots full of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You, you gotta understand, these weren't just like low-level guys who watched the stars. These were the magi. These were the wise men. They, they, they were the, some of the richest people in the entire world. And they're presenting chariots. This funded the entire ministry of Jesus Christ. You got to understand this. This funded the entire movement that was called the way, which was through Jesus Christ. This one gift, all right? They worshiped him. They were overjoyed to bring these gifts as they kneeled down before him. And with tremendous joy in their hearts, they opened up the best of what they had and gave it to Jesus. Church-wide, anybody watching online, I just, I just wonder, I just pray, I just hope that when you come into church to worship God, you give God your best form of worship. You give God your best form of praise. That, 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 that it's not just one of those things where you sit back and say, well, Pastor Mike hired Pastor Chris to lead worship, we're gonna let him do that for us. That's not, that's not what church is. Church is we have come to worship him. We have come to worship him. I had this, I had this idea yesterday. I was doing some work at my house, and, and, and I, I wanted to post it online, but I really didn't want like all the attacks and all the, the I didn't want to get into a debate online, so I just didn't do it. But I, I, I just, I really feel that the enemy knows, the enemy knows 
that the church is not gonna advance the kingdom of God sitting at home on their couches. Watching online, watching from bed. He just knows, he knows. And, 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 and then church world, church wide, we're getting so complacent again to not come together to worship the king. We're underjoyed. We're underjoyed in the most wonderful time of the year, right? Mm. So, Pastor Mike and I can already feel you saying, Pastor Mike, are you, gonna, are you gonna talk about giving and are you gonna talk about finances? Are you gonna talk about money? I just brought a friend to church today and oh my God, you know, when church talks about money, no. Do you know who gets upset about the church talking about money? People who don't understand money. People who don't understand finances. Because people who understand finances, they're all about talking about finances, right? Listen, I'm in corporate conversations all the time. I'm in the rooms of businessmen all the time. And all we talk about is money. Never a single one of them get upset when I talk about a business venture that's gonna make them a million and a half. They never get upset. Oh, really? Tell me more. Tell, tell me more. Wait, how does money work? Tell me more. So, don't be weirded out. Don't get uncomfortable. But we're gonna talk about money today. We're gonna talk about finances today. Um, and I, I know some of us are, man, I got Christmas gifts and Christmas is coming up. Pastor Mike, this is like a really bad time to talk about money. No, it's a great time to talk about money. In fact, I used to always feel uncomfortable when the church talked about money because I felt like the church didn't talk about money the right way. And so I would feel uncomfortable, but today I promise you this, I'm gonna give you a quick lesson on how money works. Is that all right? How money works. And I'm gonna tell you, money works different today than it did 50 years ago. Just so you know, when you get a piece of paper called a dollar, it's actually now called, it's actually a certificate of debt. Search your dollar bill, it no longer says equal to gold tender. Your dollar bill is not equal to gold anymore. Do you know that, right? And I'm gonna get shut off Facebook any second now. <laughs> it's actually a debt certificate that the dollar bill that you have is worth less than a dollar. Anyway. I love giving sermons, I love being generous. I read books about finances, I read books about business all the time. Um, I read books about having proper tax write-offs and tax benefits. I hope everybody in here understands the tax benefits of being generous, not just to your local church, but to nonprofit charities. It, it decreases your tax liability when it comes to tax time, okay? And so here, for the next 17 minutes or so, I wanna talk to you about finances. But I wanna talk to you about finances a little bit differently. I wanna come from the angle of love. Love gives. Love gives. Do you know what's so magical about the Christmas season? Is parents and families and loved ones get overjoyed at the idea of giving gifts to see the reaction of others because we love them. Because we love them. We save up all year, or maybe we don't, we just put it on a credit card, <laughs> to express love on Christmas Day. What's one of, what is the most popular Bible verse that pretty much everybody in the entire world knows? John 3.16. And what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he did what? Woo! Because he loves, he gave. So in order to express love, we give. Love gives, love gives. Because he so loved the world, he gave, he did not give gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but he gave his only begotten son, his only one son. That's how much he loves us. Because he loves, he gives. The creator God realized that we were separated from him through sin, and that the only way to make us right with him was to bring a perfect person, the spotless lamb that could take away the sin of the world. Therefore, he presented his son on the altar of sacrifice for us that we might be brought back into a relationship with God. That's the salvation message. 
He loves us. He wants a relationship with us, so he gave. Love gives. Love gives. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he didn't just talk about his love, he demonstrated his love. He demonstrated his love by giving his son. Love gives. Love gives. Now, there might be some in here today or watching on and say, I love God. I do. I love God with all my heart. But giving is hard for me. I'd like to give, but I feel financial pressures. I want to give, but I'm afraid, I'm hesitant, or I'm reluctant to give. And I get it. And I understand it 100%. I understand the climate that we're in. I understand the stock market just dipped uh, with the news that there's a new COVID strand, right? That, you gotta understand that that's why these things happen, right? News hits, new COVID strand, bam, market plummets in one day. Oh, I had, I had my 401k in there and I had investments in there and I, oh my God, what, is it gonna bounce back? Yes. Just don't look at it. It'll come back. But I want this church to understand something about my heart and what my role is in this ministry. My role in this ministry is not to just be and do church like it has always been done, but to literally draw the best out of every single person who hears my sermons, right? For the Pettits, for the Beals, if the best and their dreams are to be in another state living a different kind of life, oh my God. Gosh, I want to get out of their way and I want to make that happen for them as much as I can. Are you kidding me? The church should never be about holding on and controlling and manipulating. That should never be it. But I do believe that many, many, many of us have never been taught how to manage our finances. Never, never been taught. I, I, couldn't ima I couldn't believe, like, I've worked with a lot of people over the years that they were never taught how to balance a checkbook. And I know, I know I'm dating myself talking about checkbooks because nobody writes checks anymore. I get that. But they didn't even know how to balance their finances to, let, to, to know where they were with outstanding debts and outstanding bills. They had no idea. All right? So today I want to talk to you real briefly about how money works. Is that okay? Okay. Hear me out. No pressure on this. I just want to tell you how it works. You get a paycheck. Most of us today get a direct deposit, right? That's pretty much how we've come to that place where we get a direct deposit, whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly, we get a direct deposit. But before that money ever hits your bank account, stuff comes out. Does it not? Stuff comes out. So although you worked 40 hours, you never physically see in your account all the money that was paid to you for those 40 hours. Things come out. Things like New York State income tax. That's why people are leaving. <laughs> New York State income tax. Federal income tax. Social Security. If you live in New York, you're paying MTA tax. I don't even ride the train. And then, of course, health care benefits. I want to take a brief moment here and talk to you, these all things that all come out of your check are, come out what's called pre-tax. They come out of your gross pay. So before you pay income tax, your health benefits are deducted, uh, anything that you add on there, if you have a cafeteria plan or whatever, they come out of your check pre-tax. Now, here's what I wanna encourage everybody who's hearing me today to do. Hear me. Add more things to your paycheck pre-tax. Hear what I'm about to say. Invest in a 401k, an IRA, Roth IRA, simple IRA, something like that at your company pre-tax. Pre-tax. And, and I'm gonna go bold on this. And I'm just, listen, I'm just trying to help somebody who wants to retire one day. Go big on it. Invest in your future, your family's future, and your retirement one hour a day. Take one hour a day of your eight-hour workday and invest it 
into one of those things. Now, if you have a 401k or a simple IRA, a lot of your organizations will do matching up to like 3%. So whatever you put in, they'll match it up to 3%, which is amazingly great. It's free money that your organization's willing to give to you. Think about it for a second. If you gave into your future one hour a day, that would be 12.5% of your income at the end of the year. Now, I know that seems high. Like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? But we're talking about retirement. We're talking about your future. We're talking about having a plan for down the road, right? And it's pre-tax. Not only is it going in there pre-tax, but you're also going to get a higher interest rate than 0.001% that you're gonna get at the bank for our savings account. Okay, invest in your future. Invest in you. Invest in where your life is going. Now that happens all pre-tax, and now you get a direct deposit into your account. I wanna show you this. It's something that my dad raised me on. He said, son, Lamentations 327 says this, it is good for a man to bear his yoke in his youth. Do you know why the Bible says this? Bear your yoke in your youth. Work hard when you're young. Save while you're young. This is saying so that you can enjoy and reap the benefits when you're older. When you're ready to retire. When you've worked hard for 20 something years, 30 something years, you've got something to show for all of that. Bear your yoke in your youth so when you are older, you can enjoy the fruits of your labor. Budget it out. Budget it out. Decrease your, your, your uh, expenditures. Plan for your future. This all happens pre-tax. Uh, as an employee, you never see this. It, it all happens. It's automated. And then you get a direct deposit. Here's what I'm going to say now. Then, with a heart full of joy, being overjoyed that you now got a paycheck in your account. Budget out how you can be generous towards the Lord. Now, Pastor Mike, did you just tell us to only give to God based upon our net or our gross? We don't even need to get in all that. We don't even need to get in all that. We're talking about your heart. We're talking about everybody's heart. Just hear me out. If you go through your bills and you're like, Oh my God, after I paid this and I paid this and I paid this and I paid this, I, I just, uh, and, and there's this anxiety and there's this stress and there's this anger, I don't know where I'm, then you can't. Then you can't. God only promises a return on giving with a joyful heart. I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm really not the wisest person in the entire world to even be preaching this way. But what, but what did going to a church under condemnation and stress produce anyway? Nothing. It didn't bless you when you were given grudgingly and fearfully and anxiously. <laughs> now, I will say, if there's a time where there's a moment of faith that rises in your heart, and you're like, listen, I know we don't have it, but I felt that the Lord was calling us and leading us to give, even in a time that we didn't have. Well, when God calls you to that, and you can do that by faith, and you can do that with joy in your heart, man, there's a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive it all. But a church's high pressure tactics to get your money is never gonna bring a blessing. It's, it's never gonna bring a blessing. I know, man, I'm so sorry, guys. I was raised, like, I was raised watching other churches who were in the Word of Faith movement, who were high pressure giving, and it worked for the pastor. It worked for the church, but it didn't work for the people. The people were giving, 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 and they weren't living in the land that flowed with milk and honey. They weren't living the blessed life, they weren't. They kept giving it hope of one day, I'm gonna get a blessing. I'm sorry. They couldn't give with a joy-filled heart. And, and, and the church really couldn't show where the finances were going. I know. I really just, I'm never gonna get invited to a church right now after this message. <laughs> Proverbs 3, verse 5, ready? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
And lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Trust in God. Don't lean on your own ability to understand, but trust in him. Trust in Verse 7 says this, watch. Do not be wise in your own eyes. In other words, there's going to be times where we're trying to figure things out and trying to double-guess God and how does God bless and how does the giving thing work. We're never going to understand it. We're never going to understand it. Again, you got to get to a place where you're full of joy in presenting your gifts to the Lord. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and shun evil. Are you ready? This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Ready? Let's look at verse 9. Honor the Lord. This word honor here is the word worship. It says worship the Lord. Honor the Lord. How are we to honor the Lord? Honor the Lord, verse 9. Honor the Lord or worship the Lord with your wealth. With your wealth. I didn't write this. The wisest person who's ever lived wrote this. Another wise man, King Solomon, richest man in the entire world. There's never been anyone ever richer than King Solomon. I'm going to listen to what he's saying. Worship the Lord, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Pastor Mike, doesn't that first fruits just contradict everything you say about investing into retirement before? No, it does not. It does not. This is a heart thing. I was instructing you how money works today. They didn't get direct deposit then. They grew a crop and they presented it. They slaughtered a calf and they presented it. They didn't get a paycheck direct deposit. They didn't get taxes taken out. Hear me, somebody. How money works today, you can honor God with the first fruits. It's just gonna take a little bit of math. It's gonna take some math. You gotta go back, look at your pay stub. What did I get before all these things were taken out? Now I wanna give God, based upon what that is, first fruits of my income. But that has to be done with a cheerful heart. If it can't be done with a cheerful heart, don't do it. What on earth did you just say? <laughs> what I just said is there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on, Come on. Pastor Mike, preaching like this, preaching like this is going to make the church go bankrupt. Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for the things you speak of are not of the, of the Lord, but of your own of, of your own words. He says, based upon what you've said, Peter, and your revelation of who I am, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And listen, it ain't my job to actually build the church. It's his. Yeah. And to think one bad sermon about giving could bankrupt the church, that's too much power. That's not me. This isn't actually a sermon about tithing. I'm sure some of our online views have dropped significantly during this little sermon here. I'm not talking about tithing, I'm talking about being a kingdom giver, first fruits giver. So as we close out, I wanna give a little bit of vision for where we're going in 2022. 2022, in March of next year, we are launching a full-blown college here at Family Church. Fully, fully accredited bachelor's and master's degrees. It's not just going to be a school of theology. It's going to be a school of theology, a school of leadership, and a school of worship. We will be raising up worship leaders, worship pastors, musicians. The music program is solid. Um, but it's going to take some investment to get there. It's gonna take us a little bit of work to get to the place that we can do it. We are gonna have an influx of students from all over the country. We've already got 12 or 13 applications, and then one of someone who's not even connected at all with our church, uh, but have found us on the website for the college. We're, we're extremely excited about this, but there's some things that we gotta to do to get there. Now, hold on to this for a second. 
Let this resound in your hearts. In 2022, we are gonna launch a capital campaign fundraising program. I'm not putting all this pressure on us as a church. I'm gonna do my job. I'm gonna go out into the business world and I'm gonna look for companies and organizations that need tax write-offs. I'm going after it, I'm telling you. Uh, the, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. We're gonna go get it. We're gonna make it happen, all right? But we are gonna launch a building fund project, a $3 million building fund project. Now, before you think that that's a lot of money, uh, back when my dad built all this, he believed that he could build all of this for about two and a half million 16 years ago, and it ended up being double that when we were all done, okay? But we wanna do a $3 million capital campaign, full facility overhaul and upgrade. Now, I know $3 million seems like 900 miles of walking. But we're gonna do $3 million like the Magi did 900 miles, one step at a time. One step at a time. One dollar at a time, one project at a time. And we can be overjoyed that we get to be part of this during this season of life. They said, this is happening in our lifetime. The Magi said, we're seeing a star in our lifetime. We will be expanding our lobby 40 feet. We will be expanding the backstage 40 feet. We will be uh, rebuilding and reworking our classrooms uh, so that they're brought up to the standard of where we are today. Behind the stage here, we'll be building a recording studio that our students of the School of Worship will have access to 24 hours a day that they could come in and record new songs and new worship. With that, we have a vision to be producing our own albums, our own worship albums with the students and with the school that's coming up. With the, with the building of our lobby expanding 40 feet, we wanna bring our cafe out into the lobby and the cafe will be open during the week so people from the community could even come and sit in there and, and be on the Wi-Fi. The students could sit in the cafe and do their homework or their studies, all right? We want to turn what Family Church has in our 55 acres into a full-blown campus where people can come day in and day out to worship the Lord. Part of this building fund project is outside of the Fam Kids building across the parking lot in our field. We want to build a state-of-the-art playground, a state-of-the-art playground. Now, this playground is gonna be big enough, so it's not just gonna be for kids to, to climb on, but there'll be a small pavilion area where people can rent out for birthdays and community use, all right? Two years ago, we had a water, a water line break in our upstairs over our gym kitchen and our entire gym kitchen was wiped out uh, with a flood. Our glorious insurance company did not cover that, uh, that, that uh, problem, uh, so we've been without a kitchen in that gym for a couple of years now. Part of this capital campaign is to rebuild that gym kitchen with state-of-the-art cabinets and countertops. Yes. This way we'll be able to serve during events that we host in our gym. Uh, again, it will raise money to redo the fam kids uh, classrooms and bring them up to the new standard. And we would love for you to pray as to how you can partner with this and or if you're in connection with companies, organizations that would like to partner with these projects for tax write-offs and tax incentives, please let us know. Beyond all that, we're still a tithing church. We're a giving church. We give to organizations such as New Missions, Compassion International, Leading Second, Brian Pope and Ministries, ARC, ARC is um, a church planting organization. The Pregnancy Center of the Hudson Valley, The Word for You Today, Church at the Bridge, and Christian Faith Fellowship, New Jersey. We're still giving, we're giving. And with that, we also wanna give back to this church. We wanna give back to this church by doing something very, very different and unique, is that we want to bring back our Wednesday night church service, okay? We want to bring back our Wednesday night church service. But here's the deal. Your boy's not preaching. Your boy's not preaching. Okay? One of the things that I've watched is the thing that can really burn out a preacher the most is trying to do too many things. But my calling and my heartbeat is to raise the next pastors. So I want to create an environment on Wednesday nights 
where other people get an opportunity to preach. What am I gonna be doing? I'm gonna be sitting on the front row critiquing everything about their presentation. All right? I will be critiquing everything about their presentation. How they stood, their content, their biblical content, how, how they spoke, was it clear, was it choppy? And they're gonna get a grade on it. So not only are we gonna be mentoring our Bible school students, but anybody in the local church who believes that they have a calling to preach on a stage and a platform, we'll, we'll let you know if you're called. We'll let you know, because we'll, we'll, we'll judge that. We'll put you through that. Pastor Chris, he's not gonna be leading worship on Wednesday nights. Our student body and other people who feel called to lead worship will be leading worship on our Wednesday nights. What is this gonna do? This is gonna grow the kingdom of God at an exponential rate. There are 375,000 churches in North America. The average age of the pastors in office right now is 55. The average age of retirement in the church is 62, which means in the next five to 10 years, there's 150,000 churches in America that are gonna need pastors. We need to raise them up. We need to raise them up. We gotta do a little bit of work to get the next season of pastors ready to preach the word of God and to go into all the world, amen? amen? Just like the Magi were honored to be alive during this time, we should be honored and overjoyed to be alive at this time in society that God wants to move his kingdom quickly. I think he wants to advance us quickly right now. He wants to make a move forward to, to, to grow pastors and leaders and business owners in that next season of their life. And I just pray as, as this campaign begins to move forward that you would search your heart and say, Lord, what part do I have to play? What part am I called to do? Is it connect my business with this? Is it connect my finances? Is it connect serving with this? Is it to share a sermon? Is it to lead a worship set? Lord, show me, lead me, direct me. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, today that we could look into your word in a very unique and life-giving way. I pray, God, that no one leaves here today upset, disgruntled, embarrassed, offset by what the church is doing. Lord, I pray that we would not be the stumbling block that stands in the way of God moving his kingdom forward. I pray that we would ask and, and, and seek the Lord as to what part we are to play in advancing his kingdom in this season, in this time. I pray, God, that we are overjoyed to have been in the house. Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, we are protected and safe. No harm comes nigh our vehicles as we drive in the snow. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We love you. Have a great weekend. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.